Christmas. Well, it's that time of week again, of the week again. It's the Worldview Friday segment. And today's conversation is inspired by the Florida Parental Rights in Education Bill that was signed into law earlier this week and the response by the Disney Corporation to said bill. You may have heard the left vilifying it as the don't say gay bill. Earlier this month, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki had this to say about the bill. A bill like this, uh, a bill that would uh, discriminate against families, against kids, um, put these kids in a position of not getting the support they need um, at a time where that's exactly what they need, is discriminatory. It's uh, a form of bullying. Um, It is horrific. Is it a form of bullying to tell kindergartners kindergarten teachers that they can't talk to their students about gender identity and homosexuality. Well, that's what the Democratic political leadership thinks. Are they right or are they out of touch with their base? In addition, does the way the White House partners with big corporations teach us something about how to influence hearts and minds. We're going to unpack that now, right now, with my colleague David Clausen, FRC's director of the Center for Biblical Worldview. David. Good to see you. Happy Friday. Great to be back with you, Joseph. Happy Friday to you. Now, first, I want to give you a chance just to respond to Jen Psaki's comments there. It's horrific. It's a form of bullying. She's referring to a bill that tells schools that you can't teach uh, gender identity and human sexuality in kindergarten through third grades. Is that a form of bullying? Not at all, Joseph. And it just shows how out of touch the Biden White House is when they're characterizing this bill the way she is. You listen, you know, out of context, Joseph, if you were to listen to the press secretary's comments, you would think she was talking about some bill that would allow people to do horrible things to children and uh, to mislead them and misguide them and to maybe even inflict uh, harm on children. This bill, all it does is say that uh, children in the state of Florida, my home state of Florida, that are in kindergarten through third grade uh, can't be taught about gender and sexual orientation, gender identity, uh, things that even 52% of Democrats in the state of Florida don't want children to be learning. So it's a complete mischaracterization, but it does show, unfortunately, uh, the priorities of this White House. There's so many layers to this politically, and I I think I only want to get into one of them before we really get into our worldview conversation, uh, because Florida Governor Ron DeSantis has gotten a lot of support for his his position, basically supporting the bill. And also when Disney tried to threaten him, he just said, go away. I don't care what you think. And he wore their scorn and he referred to it as a badge of honor. But the question is, because the the poll you cited, even 52 percent of Democrats agree with the principle of this bill and a significantly greater percentage of of Republicans and independents also agree with the bill. Does that mean that saying no to woke corporations is no longer courageous because it's just politically good as well? Oh, I think it's just good policy, Joseph. Just, you know, a couple of years ago, North Carolina had to walk back a common sense bathroom bill that just said that biological males couldn't go in the intimate spaces of biological females. Just last year, the South Dakota governor refused to uh, sign a bill that would protect women's sports. And uh, now she's uh, done a kind of an about face and has now signed a bill. I think we've gotten to a point where the progressive left and their Uh, extreme support of kind of these woke ideologies uh, is people are now aware of what they're doing. And so just good policy um, that these governors are standing for, I think it it still does take courage. I think it still does take courage for Ron DeSantis to oppose Disney uh, and other corporations in his state. But I think increasingly uh, these kind of conservative politicians are just standing up for good policy uh, that people who are Republicans, Democrats and independents are recognizing. And we can be thankful for a world in which good policy does make good politics. That's what we want. We want the public supporting the right thing. And in this case, those stars do seem to have aligned. But David, I want to now shift the conversation 
to the reaction to this bill and particularly the reaction uh, from the Disney Corporation. And you know it in ways that other people don't because you grew up in Orlando, which is the home of the Disney company. Uh, But we heard this week as they responded, they attempted to bully Governor DeSantis. They expressed their public outrage at really what America understands to be a pretty reasonable bill. But we got a bit of an understanding of why, because this week, We were allowed behind the curtain a Zoom meeting amongst a bunch of Disney creatives and executives was made public and the curtain got pulled back a bit and we got to see how they operate and what their objectives are. And first, I want to just describe I'm going to play one video. We're going to play clip four. And this one just describes what Disney has already done in pursuit of their gender uh, goals. Let's go ahead and play that. Last summer, we we removed all of the um, gendered greetings in relationship to our life skills. So we no longer say ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Um, we, we've trained, we, we've provided training for all of our, our cast members in, in relationship to that. So now they know it's, it's hello, everyone, or hello, friends. David, uh, what's the significance of that? Well, I think it's significant because I think Disney's been unmasked. Uh, And like you said, Joseph, this is especially personal for me. My grandfather, after World War II, moved to Orlando. Uh, It was kind of a a sleepy town there in the middle of Florida. And uh, my dad tells me uh, in 1971, he was a young man when Disney came to town. And it was so exciting. And in the decade or two after Disney came to Central Florida, you you had this family, trusted, family-friendly Uh, amusement park that families from not just all over the country, but all over the world wanted to come to have family friendly fun. And, you know, those of us who have followed some of these stories closely are are not terribly surprised. But when you just hear that clip that you just played, Joseph, you know, it's it's intentional, uh, taking away uh, references to ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. They used to, I have childhood memories going to watch Disney fireworks, and you hear that phrase, and you know the fireworks are about to come, and you hear that Disney executive saying that they've intentionally removed that. It shows, Joseph, that they are subtle in what they're doing, but they are being very intentional about moving forward the goals of the moral revolutionaries. And, and keep in mind, by refusing to use terms boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, they are defying, they are standing in direct opposition to the created order as God described it in Genesis 1 when he said male and female, he created them. And it wasn't controversial uh, to say that for most of human history, but now it is. And the Disney company has specifically said, did God made th- make them male and female? No. And that's a, that should bring up memories of familiar biblical story in Genesis chapter three, because it's the entire it's the entire problem that we're dealing with is the human desire and tendency to not to be gods ourselves and to believe that we know better than what God said. But it's it's more than just the male or female. And another part of this same conversation, again, Disney creatives and Disney executives having a conversation essentially about their LGBT uh, efforts. Now we're going to play clip five and here they talk about adding queerness to all of Disney's content. Maybe it was that way in the past, but I guess like something must have happened in the last, like, like they're turning it around, they're going hard. And then all that like momentum that I felt like that sense of, I don't have to be afraid to like, Let's have these two characters kiss. Let's in the background. This are, like I was just wherever I could, just basically adding queerness to like. The, if you see anything queer in the show, I'm proud of them. But like I, I just was like, no one would stop me, and no one was trying to stop. David, what's your reaction to that? I think there's a lot of people that owe the Southern Baptists an apology. Uh, in the 1990s, Joseph, you are, might remember that uh, the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, put out a statement condemning Giz- Disney for their gay days. And there's a lot of people, even uh, Christians, who kind of mock the Southern Baptists for being prudish, uh, for being outdated. And uh, look what's happening. Uh, Disney is being unmasked. Uh, fascinating the, those comments where she said, no one was trying to stop me. I'm going to sprinkle queerness wherever I can. Uh, again, this shows, Joseph, an intentionality. Uh, this shows uh, that Disney creative people, producers, directors, uh, animators, are, are they are 
absolutely committed to a worldview uh, that is completely accommodated uh, to the demands and desires of the very far left, the LGBT activist. And I think, again, this I'm glad these videos have come uh, to we, we see these videos because it's showing that this has been going along for these people to be in these positions of influence. Uh, some of them have been at the company for a long time. It, it shows us that this is uh, something that's been subtle. It's been gradual, uh, but it has now infiltrated the entire Disney Corporation. Uh, and it's sad, Joseph. The family friendly, family trusted brand uh, is no longer family friendly or family trusted. And when you see those clips, whether it excites you or horrifies you really just depends on your perspective, because there are people who would look at that and say, yay, good for her. That's exactly what she could, what she should be doing because they agree with the moral objective of the agenda. But one point I want to make sure we get to here in the conversation is that in the same conversation, they begin to explain why this is so important. Let's go ahead and play clip six. And all this content's going for to kids who don't know any of this. And even if they're in a household like Keith uh, that have uh, supportive parents, they're still getting all of this information from media of what is normal. And we just, it's a, there's a lot of power to that and it just needs to be acknowledged. Now, David, for me, this is a point that every mother and father and grandparent watching today needs to understand this is what he just said is that they understand the power of media to define what is normal. And they use the power of story and they use art and the power of music and the combination of all of these things to create an environment where children will see things repeatedly over and over, attitudes, behaviors, scenarios, because they understand that that repetition shapes the hearts and the minds of young people so it affects what they view as normal, what they will celebrate in the future, what they will participate in in the future. Is Disney correct? I think Disney is correct, Joseph. And I think that was the most revealing clip of all, uh, talking about defining what is normal. Uh, this is a form of discipleship. This is a form of catechizing. Uh, you know, Joseph, you and I have talked about how children from K through 12th grade spend 16,000 hours in a classroom, which is why it's so important to focus on education. But children spend uh, almost every day several hours as well consuming media, consuming movies and entertainment. And all of those, Joseph, over time, gradually, subtly, have the effect of cultivating a worldview of teaching us what is right, what is wrong, uh, what uh, is something that we should uh, aspire to. And I think what we're seeing, Disney is in the, is in the business of cultivating and creating worldviews uh, for the youngest of, uh, of, of, of Americans. And that's the, you know, the story of scripture. That's our story. Creation, fall, redemption, consummation. Uh, we're in the business of stories too. Yeah. And it's increasingly clear the story that we're telling uh, in our churches and in our homes is increasingly at odds with the story that Disney and other woke corporations want to catechize our children in. That's exactly right. But I also think there's another, uh, another point to land on here for all the parents, because what Disney gets is that we can shape what feels normal to children. And that's true. And parents also can shape what feels normal to children. And pastors can shape what feels normal to children. And I think the questions we need to ask ourselves is, are the, is the, routine, are the routines of our life, are the situations that we spend our time in, are the situations that we put our children in habitually over and over and over again, are we making things that should feel normal, actually feel normal. For the lives of our children, does it feel normal to pray together? Does it feel normal to worship together? Does it feel normal to talk about the things of God together? Or is that weird? Because it only happens occasionally, and it only happens on Sunday morning. So if anybody ever brings up a conversation about God outside of church, it's awkward because that's not when we do things. And what Disney understands is that by affecting the greetings, by affecting the background scenes in the, in the movies that they create, they are shaping what feels normal. So this isn't just about us 
opposing media that normalizes the wrong things so that our kids see mom and dad as a normal situation. Of course, that's good. But we have to aim much higher than that. And it's one of the reasons that, to me, education is such an important issue. It's because that's that in classroom environment, how our teacher behaves, how their peers behave, what is accepted and tolerated, what's allowed to happen in those classrooms, shapes and defines what feels normal. And if we allow them, if we're not purposeful about those environments, they can become, they start to feel like the wrong things are normal, don't they? No, I agree with you, Joseph, and I think this can be a wake-up call for parents. Uh, and this is this is what the Bible talks about, Deuteronomy 6, that parents are to be the chief disciple-makers in their homes. And I think you just gave a couple of great things. We should normalize uh, praying. Uh, we should normalize family devotionals, uh, family worship. Some of my fondest memories as a child growing up was when we, uh, at the dinner table, we would read scripture together and we would even sing a hymn or two together. I think Christian parents absolutely need to take back uh, this this mantle, this understanding uh, that sees them as first and foremost the disciplers of their children. And I think uh, this conversation we're having is just the first of many in encouraging uh, parents uh, to, to help uh, see themselves as the disciplers in their child's life. For a lot of Americans now, it's becoming normal to use ridiculous phrases like pregnant people and say, I don't know what a woman is because they see other people doing that and it becomes normal. We can also normalize goodness and truth, but we have to try to. David, that's all the time we got. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Joseph.